Good evening. I'm Mark Grove, the President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to an evening with Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, I am never as popular as when I walk with Doris Kearns Goodwin. <laughs> Tonight, I walked through the lobby with her, and people burst into spontaneous applause. And I really appreciate you applauding for me, except that can't you do it when Doris is not around, too? Uh, we're thrilled to have Doris back home here at the LBJ Presidential Library, where she spent uh, many hours of her career. Uh, before we uh, introduce Doris properly, I want to uh, thank our friends' sponsors, St. David's Healthcare, the Moody Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and Tito's Handmade Vodka. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, always applaud vodka. It's, it's absolutely consistent. Uh, signed copies of Doris's superb book, Leadership in Turbulent Times, will be sold outside of the auditorium after the program. Also following the program, we invite friends, members, to join us for a reception on the fourth floor of the library in the Great Hall. Stay tuned for invitations upcoming for the, uh, the balance of this fall. We will have C former CIA Director John Brennan here on October 24th. We and we will have California Governor Jerry Brown here on November 7th. So please come to those programs uh, please tell your friends about the, the Friends of the LBJ Library as well. Uh, we love to see a full house. That helps us to get the kinds of guests that we are able to bring to the LBJ Presidential Library. Uh, Larry Temple, the, the chairman of the LBJ Foundation, worked in the Johnson White House for the last year and a half of President Johnson's reign in office. And he was there while there was a White House fellow named Doris Kearns working in the White House as well. It's my great pleasure to introduce Larry Temple, who will then introduce Doris Kearns Goodwin. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Larry Temple. Thank you. Before I introduce Doris, I want to pay tribute to her recently deceased husband, Richard Goodwin. Uh, Dick Goodwin uh, was a force in his own right in the 1960s. Dick uh, called himself the voice of the 1960s, and he certainly was that, one of the great, great wordsmiths of all time. Uh, Dick wrote four books and a multitude of articles on public policy, he even wrote a play. But he was probably best remembered as a speechwriter, a speechwriter for John Kennedy, and a speechwriter for Lyndon Johnson. And uh, what a speechwriter he was. He was the uh, premier speechwriter for both of those presidents. Many people say that uh, the greatest of all the speeches of Lyndon Johnson was his 1965 speech advocating the passage of the Voting Rights Act because of its importance and because of its impact. I'm one of those people that believe that is his greatest speech. Uh, let me remind you of the context of that speech, because I want to tell you one more thing about it. The context of that speech is that Dr. Martin Luther King and his compatriots, uh, the week before, had been marching from Selma, Alabama to Birmingham to uh, protest the discrimination against African Americans to preclude them from registering to vote and precluding them to vote on what later became known as Bloody Sunday. Uh, they encountered not only law enforcement people, but soldiers uh, with hoses, with water, with dogs, with batons, with clubs, and they literally beat up those marchers. Uh, and it turned out they didn't realize it, but America was watching. That was on public television for the first time. And because the public got outraged, LBJ knew it was his opportunity to try to get the Voting Rights Act passed. That was the only provision he could not get the Congress to agree to in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So he gave a speech to Congress. 
He knew what he wanted to say, and his main speechwriter, Dick Goodwin, provided the prose. And because that prose is so uh, resonant even today, I want to tell you some of the passages. I've strung these together, not necessarily in the order in which they uh, came. I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. At times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago in Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. There is no cause for pride of what has happened in Selma. There's no cause for self-satisfaction for the long denial of equal rights for millions of Americans. But there is cause for hope and for faith in our democracy in what is happening here tonight. For the cries of pain and the hymns and protests of oppressed people have summoned into convocation all of the majesty of this great government, the government of the greatest nation on earth. Our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country, to right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. This cause must be our cause because it is not just Negroes, but it is really all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And then LBJ paused and uttered the battle cry of the civil rights movement when he said, and we shall overcome. And I will say to you, this country did overcome with the partnership of Dick Goodwin and Lyndon Johnson with that battle cry, the Voting Rights Act passed uh, five months later. Uh, Dick Goodwin uh, did leave an indelible mark on his time, and we ought to all remember him uh, for the many, many things that he did. Now, I want to... I want to move now to uh, introduce uh, our honored guest tonight. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin was a newly minted PhD graduate of Harvard in 1967. She made application to uh, come to the White House and be uh, a part of uh, the uh, White House program that was created by White House fellows created by Lyndon Johnson. She made an application, but she wasn't very confident about being selected in spite of the many, many talents and the accomplishments she had. Uh, she didn't think she had much chance simply because she was an open protester of the Vietnam War. Uh, and she had written an article that got wide prominence of how to dump Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> well, that was just a challenge for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and he knew about it, and he said that if he couldn't bring her to the White House and uh, get her on his side within a year, nobody could do it. So she did get to be a White House fellow. I'll say, just as an aside, uh, I think they both got each other on their side, ultimately. Maybe not with regard to the Vietnam War, but all other things. After Lyndon Johnson uh, decided and announced he was not going to run for re-election in 1968. Uh, Doris came really on the White House staff and was actually there uh, working on uh, domestic policy and uh, anti-poverty work. When the president uh, left office in January of 1969, he uh, did his best to get her to come to Texas. He wanted her to come down here full time, work with him on his memoir and his other papers, uh, and he cajoled as only Lyndon Johnson could, but one of the rare times he was not successful. She said that she was going back to Harvard to teach, where she did teach uh, on the American presidency for 10 years. But even though he couldn't recruit her full time, he was able to recruit her part time. And over the next uh, several years, she did come here from time to time, part time, to work with Harry Middleton and Bob Hardesty and Lyndon Johnson on Lyndon Johnson's memoir. So she has her fingerprints uh, on that book. Uh, after the president's death, she continued to do her own work. Uh, and in uh, 1977, uh, she had her first 
book uh, of, as a historian, Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream. That got wide acclaim as a bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list, and that launched her career uh, as a presidential historian. What a career it's been. Uh, not in the order that she's written the books, uh, but uh, uh, her work on Franklin and uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, I'll get it out in a minute, uh, got a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it wasn't the only prize, it wasn't the only award that she ever got, uh, but it was the most important one. She got every award you can think of for a historian to write a book. Uh, her book on uh, Lincoln was the source of that magnificent uh, movie that uh, many of us saw, probably all of you, on Lincoln. Uh, she uh, wrote uh, a, a book on the Kennedys. Uh, she wrote uh, a book on uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. She has, uh, I dare say, written and studied more American presidents than any historian that we have had in this country. And now uh, you have this new book uh, on what she says the four presidents that she's lived with, uh, Lincoln, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson. And I look forward to uh, reading that book. Now let me say that her interest uh, goes a little bit beyond uh, being a presidential historian. Uh, she's a bit of a baseball nut. Uh, and uh, she uh, worked uh, with Ken Burns on Ken's uh, video on baseball. Uh, and one of the great sources of pride that she says she has is that she was the first female journalist uh, that ever went into the Boston Red Sox locker room. Now, I don't know if Mark will ask her about that tonight, but uh, we'll see in a little bit. You see her often uh, today on uh, television, uh, probably uh, meet the press primarily. She is the soft-spoken, thoughtful, kind person uh, that tries to put the current situation in historical context, if anybody can. Uh, and uh, uh, she is clearly the uh, presidential historian we all gravitate to, and it's a great, great honor, a true honor to have her here tonight. So please welcome Doris Kearns Goodwin. Doris, what better way to welcome you home than with a full house? It's, I'm so <laughs> glad to be back here. 50 years ago, oh my God. <laughs> We're glad to have you back. Uh, so Larry paid tribute to, to Dick, uh, your late husband. One of, one of the great nights of my life just came earlier this year when you and Dick and I went to, to dinner uh, back, in, back in March, I believe. And you showed me drafts that Dick had of the We Shall Overcome speech, and he talked a little bit about writing that speech. Talk, talk about his recollections of writing that incredibly important and impactful speech. Well, what happened is that President Johnson decided on a Sunday that he was going to give a speech to the joint session of Congress on Monday. <laughs> so Dick came in at his leisurely time the next morning and, and said, how's Goodwin doing on the speech? Anyway, he sat down to write it that morning and only had that morning until that night. But I think, as Larry said, and as we know, he knew what was in Lyndon Johnson's heart. They both felt this passion, not only for civil rights, for the great society. When I listen to those words, you know, what seems so heartbreaking is to remember what it was like to live in the 60s at a time when there was a common purpose for us all, when we were trying to make life better for people, when you had words like this, not only at this moment, but the Great Society and the Howard University speech, and bills coming out one after the other in the Congress. It was thrilling to be young then. And I sometimes think about the young people now and wishing that I could catapult them back then so that they would know this is what public service is. This is what it means. This is what it means to follow the ideals of America. And we can't forget that. We'll talk about that tonight. I think it's so important for all of us in this terrible time of anxiety um, to remember that history has been there before. We've been through tough times. When President Johnson first came in to office, um, the Kennedy's bill was stuck. They thought it would never come out, never come out of the Congress. There would be a filibuster if it did. Nothing else would get done. In fact, there was an article shortly before 
um, Kennedy died, saying that the Congress is, is, a, is broken. You know, but there's something wrong with our republic. None of his signature bills were coming out. And yet, yet within that first 18 months, you have civil rights, voting rights, aid to education, Medicare, Medicaid, immigration reform, PBS, NPR, Head Start, aid to the cities. It was thrilling, absolutely thrilling to be alive then. And I just hope all of you who remember that time will carry that optimism on to the next generation who may wonder, will we ever live in such a time again? We will, I promise. <laughs> You write in Leadership in Turbulent Times about four presidents with whom you've spent a great deal of time. Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and of course, Lyndon Johnson, whom you knew. Why this book? What, what, what led you to write this book after having spent time with these men in books that you wrote about each of them? Well, part of it was that each time I finish a new book, um, an old book right on the president. I have to move his papers out of my study and put them somewhere else to make room for the new guy. And I always felt like I was leaving an old boyfriend behind, like it was kind of traitorous what I was doing. So after I finished Teddy and Taft, I thought, so should I do a new person? And I just felt like I really need to think about these four people even more. They've occupied my life for 50 years. And I hadn't really thought of them in terms of leadership. I mean, obviously it was embedded in these other books. But even when I was in graduate school, it sounds rather nerdy, but we used to stay up at night and think about questions like, where does ambition come from? Um, does the man make the times or does the times make the man? Is leadership born or is it made? Um, all these kind of questions we used to stay up at night thinking about. And I thought, what if I started asking those questions now? And, and it was such a great adventure to do it because I hadn't thought about when they first thought of themselves as leaders, how they were as young people, what their pivotal moments were. So it was a, a new adventure for me. And I think in some ways they all led in turbulent times, far more turbulent than our times. Now people keep asking me, you know, is this the worst ever? And I can say from the experience of studying these four guys that it's not the worst. <laughs> and that's a good thing because we got through them and we got stronger and we were more unified than before. And we can't forget that. I mean, that's where history is forgotten at its peril because if we can just remember that America has been strong before, we look at, and, and we'll, we'll do it. The citizens were there. When I think about what made that We Shall Overcome speech and the Voting Rights Act possible was the civil rights movement. And always it's that. The, when Lincoln was told that he was the liberator, they said, don't call me that. It's the anti-slavery movement that did it all. So the citizens produced the anti-slavery movement. They produced the progressive movement under TR and FDR, the civil rights movement with LBJ, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the gay rights movement. It's up to us as citizens right now to take this banner and figure out how to reform our political system because it needs reformation. It You, uh, you write in this book about, um, well, they, actually, it's interesting. There are links between all these men. Uh, I don't think that was intentional, but it's, it's, or, or maybe it's largely coincidental, but talk about how they're linked together. Yeah, I didn't really think about this until near the end yeah. of the book, that it just shows how small a history, how short a history the American history is, because um, Lyndon Johnson's hero was FDR. He called him his political daddy. He entered Congress as a New Deal congressman. Their relationship when they're young is, when he's young is so interesting, which we can talk about. And then FDR's hero was Teddy Roosevelt. And he had, he had really been interested in him when he was young because he's, he, obviously he was Eleanor's uncle, but more than that, he loved the kind of fiery spirit of Teddy and what the square deal represented. Teddy's hero was Abraham Lincoln. In fact, in the summer when there was this terrible cold strike that was devastating the country for six months, there was no coal getting to New England, he spent the entire summer reading the eight volumes of Nicolay and Hay on Abraham Lincoln. And he would often talk to people about, look, this is what Lincoln went through, and I'm, I have a similar situation. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to figure it out. And then Abraham Lincoln's hero with the founding fathers and George Washington. So there's the history of our country encapsulated in like a family tree of these guys. It's like one of those boxes you open up and the next guy pops out. <laughs> the, the, you write in the, uh, in the book's introduction, you quote uh, American philosopher William James, who writes of the mysterious formation of identity this way. He says, I have often thought that the best way to define a man's character would be to seek out the particular mental or moral attitude in which 
uh, when it came upon him, he felt most deeply and intensely alive and active. At such moments, there's a voice inside which speaks and said, says, this is the real me. So you write about the, uh, the development of these men uh, chronologically. And there are certain formative periods in their lives where they develop as people, they face certain crucibles. Talk about those for each, each of the men that you cover. When did they say, this is the real me? You know, it's interesting. The reason I decided to go back and start the book when each one of them went into public life for the first time was because I was at a college audience some many years ago. I was talking about FDR or Lincoln, and a kid raised his hand and said, how can I ever imagine becoming him or one of them? They're too remote. They're on Mount Rushmore. They're in the currency. So I thought, what if I start when they're young, going into public life for the first time? They're going to make mistakes. They're going to fail. They're going to be confused. Then we as young people could identify with them. Our, their struggles would be like ours. So with, with Abraham Lincoln, that, that moment really comes. He's 23 years old. It's incredible. He's in New Salem, Illinois. He's just been there for six months and he decides he wants to run for the state legislature. And in those days, you put out a handbill and you had to say what it was that you stood for. No political bosses, nobody's choosing you. Anybody could run if they put out this handbill. And his is amazing. It says, every man has his peculiar ambition. Mine is to be esteemed of by my fellow man by being worthy of their esteem. And then he talks about the fact that he's pretty sure that he may not have a great chance in this election. He has no wealthy relations to support him. And he said, but if the good voters don't put me in, I've been too familiar with disappointment to be very much chagrined. But then he says, um, but you know, he promises, um, I'm going to try this even if I keep losing five or six times until it's so embarrassing and humiliating, I promise I'll never try again. <laughs> so even at that young age, he knows that failure is part of success. And, and I think when he was out on that campaign trail for the first time, even though he did lose, and then the next time he won, because the more people met him in the county, the more they voted for him, he knew this is what I want to be. It is a moment, maybe it's one, one of the moments for all of us, when you find out what is that work, what is that avocation, what is that thing that makes you feel so good inside that it's connected to you. With Teddy Roosevelt, it was different. I mean, when he was 23, he also ran for the state legislature. But he, was, he ran because somebody came to him, a political boss, and asked him to run because they knew that his father had been a well-known philanthropist in New York, and they figured he would have a, a good name to go with it, and he had wealth to help support it. And he admitted later that he just went in for the adventure of it. It wasn't to make life better for other people. He wrote an essay about this. But then what happened is, as a state legislator, he went into the, the slums. He went into these dilapidated tenements. As police commissioner, he's wandering the streets of New York at night. As a soldier in the army, he's, he's sheltering and eating with the soldiers. As a governor, he finally learns about the corruption between the political bosses and the business world. His political career taught him something. It makes me sad when I think that in 2016, political experience was considered a liability rather than a strength. But in his case, he just learned through it. And he learned empathy. I think Lincoln was born with it. He was born caring about his friends who were putting hot coals on turtles to make them wriggle. And he just told them that was wrong. But Teddy didn't have it right away. But then through these experiences, he said, you can gain fellow feeling. You can learn about the way other people think. And you may feel conscious at first if you're coming in from your privileged background, being in these slum settings. But after a while, you're going to feel and think what these other people are feeling. And he said something so relevant for us today. He said, the rock of democracy will founder at that moment when people think of each other from different sections, classes, or races as the other instead of as common citizens of America. So once he started that political career, that's when he felt, this is what I want to be. Franklin took a little longer. He was 28 rather than 23, and he hadn't had a very distinguished leadership career up till that point. He'd been an indifferent student at Harvard, at Columbia, at, um, at Groton before that. And he was in a Wall Street conservative law firm. And then, and then all of a sudden, they come to him again and say, would you like to run for a safe Democratic seat in Dutchess County? And again, it wasn't because he had shown makings of a leader, unlike Lincoln showing it earlier. It was because he had a wealthy mother, and he had the Roosevelt name. And Teddy Roosevelt, they thought some Democrats would vote for Franklin because they think he was Teddy. So anyway, he says, yes, 
And once he got out barnstorming, he loved it. I mean, he was natural with people. He would talk to them. He would listen to them. He wasn't a very good speaker at first. Eleanor was there at the time, and she said he would pause so much that everybody worried he was never going to go on. And then after a little few months on the campaign trail, after a while, she'd have to come up on the stage and pull him off because he was talking for two hours straight. But at a certain point, he knew, this is what I want to be. This is my natural talent. I'm gregarious. I love being with people. Even though he'd come from that insulated world, it was right for him. I think with, with Lyndon Johnson, it was there from the time he was born, <laughs> that he loved listening to his father, talking with his friends on the porch. He loved. Um, going with his father on the campaign trail. So there's a certain moment when he too is in his, his 20s and he's at a picnic, this great picnic, and they, they call people up to stand on the back of a truck like to, to encourage you to vote for somebody who's running for office. And there was a guy named Governor Neff running for office and nobody was there to speak for him. And suddenly Lyndon pops up, I'll speak for him. Sam Johnson's boy comes up and he gives this stem winding, fabulous, energetic speech. And then that was the hit of the picnic. And I think that's when, even if before, I think that's when he knows, ah, this is great. I like this. And, that, and of course, he was the most natural politician of them all. Anyone with a, even a cursory knowledge of Franklin Roosevelt can cite a quote, or actually more uh, an assessment uh, of FDR by Oliver Wendell Holmes, the famous Supreme Court justice, who upon meeting Franklin Roosevelt just before uh, Roosevelt took the presidency, said uh, he has a second-class intellect, uh, but a first-class temperament. And you go on to write, generations of historians have agreed with Holmes, pointing to Roosevelt's self-assured, congenial, optimistic temperament as the keystone to his leadership. But you dispute the fact that he had a second-class mind. How so? Well, they just decide that he has a second-class mind because he wasn't academically proficient at school. That's ridiculous. He had an extraordinary problem-solving mind. He was able to be presented with a, stiff, a problem. Like, for example, how are we going to get immediately a bunch of young people, when he first comes into office during the Depression, into jobs? Because we're going to lose a whole generation. Is my, my feeling OK? You can hear me OK? It's, it's myself that I'm not hearing. So he said that. Um, he knew that a whole generation would be lost if they couldn't have jobs when they were young. So he comes up with the whole idea of the Civilian Conservation Corps that will get the Army to figure out how to get these kids recruited. We'll get the Interior Department to set up camps in the, in the forests. We need to help the trees anyway in the forest. We need to have building things. And within two months, a quarter of a million kids are working in this CCC. He thought it all through. He figured out the bureaucratic tangles. So too, when he was on a fishing trip in 1940, and Churchill had run out of, of money to buy weapons and supplies in the German invasion they thought was going to happen later that year, and Churchill sends him a letter saying, we have to do something. He's on this fishing trip, which allowed him to think, 10 days away thinking. He came up himself with the whole Lend-Lease idea that if you lend these weapons to Britain, they could give it to us after the war, which cut through all the neutrality acts. Even as I'm saying all that, so that's his mind, his temperament is critical. I mean, temperament, I think, again, it's something that it's your basic stance to the world. It's how you treat people. It's your sense, in his case, that optimism that he was born with that got him through his polio, that got him through the Depression, that got him through World War II. The, the, so if that's a misconception about Franklin Roosevelt, what misconceptions do we have about Lincoln, TR, and LBJ? Whoa. Well, I, I, think, I think, you know, with Lincoln, certainly, before I really lived with him for those 10 years, I knew, of course, that he was a great statesman. Um, I don't think I understood um, what a great politician he was, you know, how, how, how really sophisticated he was at figuring out how to do transactional pro, you know, politics as well as anything else, where you'd put money in, where you'd give somebody something they needed for that. But more importantly, I had no idea how funny he'd be. I didn't think I'd be laughing as much during the 10 years. I thought I'd be with that straight-faced, sad, kind of melancholy face that I knew he had. But humor was his way of dealing with, with the world. Um, from the time he was young, he said that, he, you know, that a good story for him was better than a drop of whiskey that it was the only way he could get through the world. And just hearing the stories that he told over and over again, when he was a young lawyer on the circuit in Illinois, they used to travel from one county courthouse to the other, and they'd stay in the same taverns at night. And whenever Lincoln was there, people would come from miles around to him, listen to stories. And his stories sometimes, would he could talk for hours, one winding tale after another. And 
sometimes his stories had a moral, like the Aesop's fables he loved as a child, but sometimes they were just simply hilarious. My favorite story was told by Daniel Day-Lewis and Steven Spielberg. I really hoped they would do it, and they did in the movie Lincoln. Lincoln loved to tell the story of the Revolutionary War hero, Ethan Allen, who went to England after the war. And these are the kind of stories he told. And they were still upset about losing the revolution, so he's at a dinner party. They decide to put a huge picture of General George Washington in the outhouse, the only outhouse. He'll have to encounter it sooner or later. They figure he'll be so irritated at the idea of George Washington in an outhouse. He comes out not upset at all. And they say, well, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. I think it was the perfectly appropriate place for him. What do you mean, they said? Well, he said, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. <laughs> and he had, he had hundreds, hundreds of these stories. So you can imagine, you're in, so I just was so happy. There's another moment, somebody yells at him, Lincoln, you're two-faced. His immediate response is, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this face? <laughs> so that was my misconception about him. I think about Teddy, the interesting thing. I haven't thought about this question, so this is um, really interesting to try and think it out in my own head. We always think of him as this fiery guy, and he was with blistering language. In fact, when he was a young legislator, he said so many terrible things about the opponents that were after him that he made headlines everywhere, but then he couldn't get anything done, so he le learned that he had a swelled head. And the thing is, and he also had attitudes toward war that, that are really tough to understand, that the victories of war are better than the victories of peace, that there's nothing like seeing a bullet go by, and I mean, just crazy romantic stuff about the sentimentalization of war. And I knew that stuff, so I wasn't sure how I was gonna feel about him as president. But the interesting thing as president is he was very peaceful as a president, and he won the Nobel Prize, actually, for peace. But more importantly, he was able to, to ratchet down that fiery spirit when he had to. In the coal strike, which is one of the case studies at the end of the book, there are times when he's so angry at the coal barons who are in a meeting with the miners and they won't come to any agreement that he wants to throw them out the window, he said, but he holds onto his chair and he keeps his temper down. And he actually handled that with great restraint. So I think he had more restraint than, than I knew he had because I just saw him this fiery, colorful character. And I, you know, I would think it's, it's hard to know with, with, with Lyndon Johnson just because of knowing him so much, but um, I think that his understanding of his visionary, his visionary sense of where he wanted to take America, I was stunned to, to realize this later. I don't think I even knew it at the time that that night, in fact, I opened one of the chapters with this, the night when John Kennedy is killed, um, he is in the White House. I mean, he's always in Elm, in Elm what's it called? The Elms. The Elms. The Elms. Um, they're all watching television. So he's with Moyers and, is it Horace Busby and too? And, yeah, and Valenti. And they're watching the television. And he outlines right that night all the things he wants to do. I'm going to get a tax cut through and the economy's going to get stronger. And then I'm going to get civil rights through and I'm not going to change a word of what John F. Kennedy had. And then I'm going to get voting rights because that's so important to have voting rights. And then I'm going to get everybody to have as much education as they can possibly get. And then I'm going to get old Harry Truman's Medicare through. Unbelievable. He said that that night. He saw it. He saw what he wanted to do. And by God, he did it. So I, we think of him as this guy who can bring people together. I think the other misconception about him is the idea that the way he got it done was to trade things with people. And he did do that. I mean, with, with Dirksen, when he needs Dirksen to help break the filibuster, bring the Republicans to go along with the Northern Democrats, he's, they sit over drinks and they're trading everything. Every, Illinois would be sunk in all the projects that were going to go there. But then what he really understands is that Dirksen wants to be remembered by history just as he did, just as everybody whose ambition goes from self to something larger. And so he says, Everett, you come with me on this bill, and 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> how could Dirksen resist? So he knew how to appeal to the idealism of the people yeah. to make them understand what this was about for them and their children's children, as well as all the bargains he could make. Uh, make no mistake, this is certainly a, a book about presidents, and so it, it really looks at our history and these men and how they sh helped to shape it. But it's also very much a business book on leadership. And Doris writes about the types of leadership embodied by these individuals. For Lincoln, it's transformational leadership. And you write of Lincoln, transformational leaders inspire followers to identify with something larger than themselves. The organization, the community, the region, the country. And finally, to the more abstract identification with the ideals of that country. Why was, why was Abraham Lincoln 
successful in guiding the country through the Civil War? Well, I think what, what he had to do in, for example, he had to change the meaning of the war from just fighting to preserve the Union to emancipating the slaves. And that was a very big thing because, and that's where transformation of attitudes comes because most of the people in the North originally were fighting it just for the Union. They, they, they were worried if we introduced emancipation into it, the war would never come to an end. There would be no peace with the South. Um, the army itself, only three out of 10 people in the army at the beginning were fighting for something larger than Union being preserved. So he had to persuade first his cabinet, who were, many of them, were, they, some of them said they'd resign if he did this Emancipation Proclamation. They said he'd lose the midterm elections, that he would make the war go on forever. Then he had to persuade the army, and then he had to persuade the country. And it was his person that was able to do that. He believed so much when he finally came to the decision that he was gonna issue the Emancipation Proclamation that he was able to deal his cabinet when they finally came to it, if they had reservations still, they, they didn't make them public. They had to be a family. He had visited so many army soldiers. Every battle he went to visit them after each battle. He told them if they had any complaints, they could come to the White House. And when he finally said, we're fighting for this as well, they said to themselves, if Abraham Lincoln believes that, then I will believe it too. And they wrote home to their parents and said, we're now doing something different. We're waging this war for something different. And then same thing for the country. His speeches gave them the understanding between the Gettysburg Address later, between even speeches before that of why America needed to, to end slavery as the sin that we had come into the country with. And they, they came to his side because of that. That's, that's when you transform people's attitudes and they become a different person. And we became a different country by ending slavery. There is perhaps no president who will ever face a crisis bigger than that, that Abraham Lincoln faced. What is the, the most important leadership lesson we can derive from Lincoln's example? I, I think probably it's the combination of patience. And he had com combined a lot of things. Like he was confident, but he had humility. He would always acknowledge errors when he made them. He would, he would shoulder blame for other people. He was patient and perseverant, but he could move on when he had to. He could make that big decision. He was merciless in fighting that war. You had to keep fighting it no matter how many people died for the cause that it was, but he was merciful. I mean, he spent his nights when he couldn't sleep about the war pardoning soldiers so that somebody else didn't have to die according to the other people. And obviously he had a gift for language that gave a meaning to that war that was so important for people at the time. So it was a combination, I think, of qualities that just made him, and in the end, you know, in a certain sense, I think he was a good person that became a great leader. That's not always true in politics, that goodness becomes greatness. But I kept thinking, if only I could become more like him. It wasn't that he didn't feel the normal human emotions of envy or anger or jealousy, but he said if you allow those emotions to fester, they'll poison a part of you. And so every time you feel one of those emotions, Lincoln would say, stop it, you're wasting time. Uh uh, Doris talked about Lincoln telling a great story, but I want to tell a great story about Doris and Daniel Day-Lewis, who played uh, Abraham Lincoln in the film Lincoln, based on her book, Team of Rivals. And uh, uh, her uh, manager, Beth Lasky, told me of a story where the, the two of them, Daniel Day-Lewis and Doris Kearns Goodwin, were having lunch in a restaurant, and someone, uh, a woman breathlessly came up to the table and said, excuse me, I hate to interrupt, but are you Doris Kearns Goodwin? <laughs> It was actually a very funny story because when he first went to Springfield, to he had just agreed to become Lincoln, and, and Spielberg was so happy that he asked me to take him to Springfield to show him all the sites, but they didn't want to announce that he was becoming Lincoln because he wanted a whole year to become Lincoln. So we were supposed to eat in the hotel, not go anywhere, and of course we go somewhere and immediately that somebody brought us the drinks and I thought, oh my God, it's over, but it was me. So it became a joke between us. But so finally, after the movie was over, we went to a premiere together in LA and then New York. So he said, well, we have to go to a bar now to celebrate that first day when, when you were the one that they were looking for. So we went to this bar at the Carlisle in New York and I had these ridiculous old Cuban drinks that he liked and everything was fine. But then he gets the first of his series of awards and Spielberg comes up to him and, and gives an introduction to him and says how he had rejected the role several times in previous scripts, um, but finally he had accepted. And he wrote beautiful rejection letters and Spielberg read the letters. So then Daniel gets up there 
and unaccountably, because there's a Wall Street reporter in the room to report it the next day, said, I don't reject everything. When Doris Kearns Goodwin asked me to go binge drinking with her at the Carlisle, I accepted it <laughs> once. I was proud. <laughs> For Theodore Roosevelt is an example of uh, a, a, a crisis leader. And his crisis was the great coal strike of 1902, of which you write, the unfolding of the president's creative handling of what was viewed as the most formidable deadlock in the history of the country offers a demonstration of groundbreaking crisis management. How so? How was this groundbreaking? So, so what happened is that um, the miners under John Mitchell, an extraordinary union leader, had gone on strike. The conditions in the mines were terrible. And no longer did a local person own the mines so that they knew the workers. By now, you had companies on top of companies. This was part of what Teddy had to fight, that the big companies were swallowing up the small companies. So the coal barons who owned them didn't care about how long the strike went on. It was going on month after month after month. And at that point, the president had no power, no precedent to intervene in a strike between labor and management. He even didn't have power to invite the two guys to the White House to talk about it. And he had to figure out how to seed the ground so that he could gain that power. So he did invite the coal barons and the miners to a meeting in the White House. And the coal barons wouldn't even talk to the miners. The meeting turned out to be a terrible failure. I mean, they said, we're not talking to these guys. They're striking. They're violent. And that's when Teddy had to sit in the chair doing this. But what he did was so smart. Before the meeting began, he asked if he could have a stenographer take down the words of the meeting. And meanwhile, public sentiment didn't know where to fall on this. They knew that they were upset about the, the mines being stopped because of the union, and they, were, they knew the barons weren't helping very much. But still, they were kind of mixed. But then he published this whole meeting where the union guys had said, we'll make any kind of agreement. If you set up a presidential commission, whatever you come up, we'll accept that. And the coal baron said, we won't do anything that he agrees to. So anyway, he publishes the notes, and all of a sudden, the sentiment changes. And then as it gets closer to fall, people are worried about where is the coal going to come. Hospitals are closing down. Schools are closing down. And he can't get any movement from the management and the labor guys until finally he realizes, what if somebody else, other than me, because they're mad at Teddy, other than the, the union leader, suggests a presidential commission? So he has his, his, one of his co colleagues in the cabinet go and see J.P. Morgan. He says, if you suggest it, because J.P. Morgan is the financier for all these guys. And J.P. Morgan was a great citizen at that moment. He went and met with the coal barons. He suggests the idea of a presidential commission. And then they say, OK, because they're saving face. And Teddy understood the importance of saving face. And then finally, they agree. The commission happens. Both sides are happy with the result. And it was the biggest domestic crisis that any president had faced at that time. And it was because he had restraint, because he had patience, because he also understood. And again, he got this from Lincoln. He said, um, OK, there's two guys, two, two forces in this. There's labor and management. But I represent the people. I'm the steward of the people. And so he set the narrative that he, as president, had the responsibility to care for the American people who were being hurt by these two sides not being able to get together. Mm -hmm. the, uh did, does he actively emulate Lincoln, do you think, Theodore Roosevelt? I do think so. I mean, I think, you know, he would, he would read about um, the idea that Lincoln could hold back his anger. He would read about Lincoln being caught between radicals on one side and conservatives on the other and trying to forge a middle ground. And I think he thought with the Square Deal, his signature program, which was to break up the big monopolies, to regulate the railroads, to regulate companies that were not playing by the rules of the game, that he was really Lincoln-esque in a sense because it was for the capitalist and the wage worker, for the rich and the poor. It wasn't going on either side or another. So yeah, he would read out loud to Nicolay and Hay, his secretaries, I've just read this thing, you know, and here's, here, here we go, that Nicolay and Hay had read, actually, that written. Right. Uh, like Lyndon Johnson, um, Theodore Roosevelt comes into the presidency through tragedy, the assassination of William McKinley in his case. When, how does he find himself in the presidency? When does it become his own office? Well, interestingly, I think he sort of felt like he was president from the first day. I mean, he loved being in the center of attention, and now he certainly was. I mean, his daughter Alice said he loved, so loved being in the center of attention that he wanted to be the baby at the baptism and the bride at the wedding and the corpse at the funeral. <laughs> so, but smartly, even though he announces to the journalist, I am president right away, he didn't want people to think he was a caretaker. 
because he, it was only one year into McKinley's term. And he'd been put in the vice presidency to get rid of him, because they thought he was too progressive. And they figured he'll have nothing to do in the vice presidency. And it was a graveyard for future candidates. And they figured that the bosses thought, the conservative bosses, this is the end of him. And he was so bored as vice president, he wanted to go to law school. In fact, he started going back to law school. And, but then he suddenly becomes president with McKinley's assassination. But very wisely, he keeps McKinley's cabinet. In, in, in throws right at that time. And his friends say to him, how can you do that? They're not going to be loyal to you. And he says something that's so relevant today. He said, it's not loyalty to me that matters. It's loyalty to their job and to the country. And if they do that, I'm going to keep them on. If they don't, they'll be gone. So I think he, he, was, always, he was always knowing that he was a leader from the time he was in the Spanish-American War, where he Felt. He said, I'm not as good a horseman as these other guys. I'm not as good an athlete, not as good a gunshot person. But I'm their leader, and I knew it within a week after he was leading them. Franklin Roosevelt's crisis is, of course, the Great Depression, uh, which threatened not only our capitalist system, but our democracy itself. And you write about his turnaround leadership, particularly in his first 100 days. You write of that Roosevelt knew at once that three lines of attack were necessary. First, the feelings of helplessness, impotence, dread, and accelerating panic had to be reversed before any legitimate recovery could commence. Then, without delay, the financial collapse had to be countered. And finally, over time, the economic and social structure had to be reformed. Turnaround would forever, the, the, the turnaround that ensued, you write, would forever alter the relationship between the government and the people. How does this, this uh, uh, remarkable human being manage this extraordinary turnaround. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it really was a three-pronged fight that he had to fight. And the first was to give confidence and optimism back to the American people. And how lucky that that was his own gift as a temperament, but one that was made so much stronger because of the way he handled his polio attack. I mean, here he was in his 30s. Um, he had been an athlete before, and he loved to walk in the woods and to play golf and to play tennis. And now suddenly he can't walk he, on his own power ever again. And what he was able to do was to just years of anxiety and depression and fear to just believe that I'm going to keep making one forward movement at a time. So in his wheelchair, he asks to be let down on the library floor so he can practice crawling so his back will get stronger. When he goes to... To, in a certain sense, when he goes to Warm Springs, the rehabilitation center that he builds for polio patients, he's doing what he needed to do for the country in that inauguration. They came there not simply to get physical rehabilitation, but he knew that they felt their lives had been forever changed and there was nothing that could make them happy again. And so he teaches them how, and they're in the pools together, he's showing his vulnerability. He teaches them to play water polo and tag. They have cocktail hours at night. They watch movies. They have amateur theatricals. They have wheelchair dances. And they all say that we now believed in ourselves again. So that very first inaugural, much more important than there's nothing to fear but fear itself, was that he projected his optimism and his confidence. And he made the people feel, this is not your fault that you don't have a job. It's the system that's at fault. And we're going to attack that system as if it's an army going after a, a battle. And there's going to be action, and there's going to be action now. If the Congress won't give it to me, I'm going to assume the powers that I have to have. And they, right after that one inaugural, people felt differently. This, this wonderful letter I remember once reading came to the Roosevelt Library. It said something like, the roof fell off my house. My dog ran away. I've lost my job. My wife is mad at me. But you're there now, so everything's going to be OK. <laughs> so that was the first step, to just sort of stop this downward slide of, of psychological understanding. And then we were in this terrible crisis because of the banking system having collapsed. People had been taking their money out of the banks because some of the banks had fallen because they had used the depositors' money to go to the stock market. The stock market crashed. They didn't have money. Other banks were sound, but people were so worried they were taking all their money out of there, too. And so he goes the first day he gets in, he knows this is the crisis he has to, if the banking system collapses, then the whole country collapses. So he calls a euphemistically named bank holiday for a week. All the banks will be closed so he can figure out the legislations that's needed to shore up the weak banks and to make sure that the strong ones have enough currency. And then what he does is he has to persuade the American people that it's safe to bring your money back. And he has a week to do that. The bill passes in that week. And then that, that Sunday night before the Monday when they're going to open again, he has his first fireside chat. 
And those fireside chats were instrumental in his way of communicating with people. And what he does that night is he explains to them, when you put your money in a bank, it doesn't just sit in a vault. It goes and makes the wheels of commerce go around in loans and mortgages and industries. And then he explains what happened that some of these banks put it in the stock market. And then he says, I assure you now with this new bill, that is safer than being in a mattress to bring your bank money back to the bank. So the next line, there's huge, they're terrified, huge lines at every bank. They're bringing their money back to the bank because they believed in what he was doing. And that stopped the financial crisis. But then, then the, the, the guys who are the elite guys, the banking guys, say, that's it, now that's go away. But he says, no, we have to get systematic reforms to figure out why this happened in the first place. And that's the next fireside chat he gives that talks about the fact that the system had failed and big changes had to be made in the way government regulates business, the way jobs are going to be found for people, the way the private system isn't helping. We've got to have the public system working. We need a TVA. We need Securities Exchange Commission. And that's the turnaround that by the end of that 100 days, the whole relationship has changed. But it changes primarily because he was able to establish trust in the part of the people. That's one of the, the most important things, I think, in leadership is that your word matters and that the people trust that you will do what you say you can do. And those fireside chats were so effective that the people sitting in their living rooms or kitchens thought he was actually talking to them. There's a story of a construction worker coming home one night. And the partner says, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to my living room. My president's coming to see me there. And I have to be there to meet him when he, when he comes. And there's a moment, so he established that intimate relationship with people that they felt he was talking to them as an individual, not to them as a people. And in fact, it was borne out when he died, there were these extraordinary statements that the New York Times described, people standing in, in, in places all over the country, strangers hugging themselves and saying to each self, we've lost our friend, we've lost our friend. And then one person, the great tribute was, he said, um, isn't it extraordinary that one man dies and 130 million people feel lonely as a result? It was that bond that he created. In a democracy, he said, if you tell people the truth, if you don't pretend that things aren't difficult, which they were during the Depression, which they were in the early days of the war, he trusted the American people would come and do what they needed to do. And God, they stayed through the Depression. I mean, given what else could have happened, the violence that could have happened in this country, they, they became the backbone that becomes the greatest generation in World War II. Where does FDR's buoyancy, this boundless optimism that sustained us through this dark and desperate time come from? I think sometimes that it, you're born with that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do think there was, I, in one of those questions about are leaders born or made, you know, I think that um, empathy was born in Lincoln. It was created, perhaps, in these others. I think it was born in LBJ as well. I mean, he's pretty young when he's feeling, talking to young, talking to older people on the streets and asking older women, how are you doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with, with Teddy, I think he was born with a photographic memory, with an extraordinary kind of brilliant, brilliant intellect in a lot of ways. And with FDR, I think he's born with that optimistic temperament. I mean, I'd like to believe, I mean, when I think about the greatest gift my parents gave to me, even though my mother died when I was 15, my father died in his 20s, they both gave to me that confidence and love that I was, I was so important in their lives that I think it, it came to me as a sort of, I think I was born with an optimistic temperament, but then life allowed me to continue it despite the early deaths of my parents because of, of what they gave me. I never felt, never felt unloved by them for one second. And I think that was true for FDR. He was the center of his mother's life, and his father loved him as well. And he had this incredible life. I mean, he said, all that is in me goes back to the Hudson with that smooth, unbroken life. And even though things later were very difficult for him, that confidence and optimism was so deep within him that they couldn't shake it. So while we're on the subject, uh, um, uh, you, you asked the question, are, are great men, uh, great leaders born or, or made? And you answered for, for some of the leaders you've covered here. But on balance, uh, is, are, are, are leadership skills innate? Or are they honed through our experiences? Much more honed through experiences, without a question. I mean, Teddy wrote an, a really interesting essay where he was talking about there's two kinds of success. One is if you're born with a talent that nobody else could, even if they tried, emulate, like a Keats writing a poem. Or he said a Lincoln at Gettysburg. But he said most success 
is when a person develops ordinary qualities to an extraordinary degree through the application of hard, sustained work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. That's true of, of all these people. I mean, and especially true, I think, of Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. Every talent that he had, he was the first person in the office in the morning. He was the last person there at night. Um, he, he gave that sense of work ethic to the team that was working with him. Um, and, and his energy just got rebounded by it. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's sometimes an outlier with mm -hmm. these other people because they all were able to relax more easily than he was. He didn't, un, he didn't unwind very easily. He would say when he went to movies, he didn't like it because it was dark and you couldn't talk in it. And we'd go, <laughs> he would go, we'd go to baseball games and he'd be talking politics in the middle of the innings. I remember going with him once, I want to watch the game. We're talking politics. But these other guys understood more than he did, I think. But I think Johnson just had more energy than everybody else, that it was OK for him. But um, Lincoln went to the theater 100 times during the war. He said when the lights came down and, and a Shakespeare play he came on for a few precious hours, he could forget the war that was raging. And um, Teddy Roosevelt exercised for two hours every afternoon. He would go on a um, tennis match or a wrestling match or a boxing match, or he'd go on these ridiculous hikes in, in Rock Creek Park where he made a rule that you couldn't go around any obstacle. You had to go through it. So if you came to a rock, you had to go up it. If you came to a precipice, you had to go down it. People were following him on these stupid walks, <laughs> falling by the wayside. But the great story has to do with the French ambassador, Jules Jusserand. He went with him on the first walk in the woods, and he's wearing his silk tie, and he thinks they're going to be walking in the Champs-Élysées. And they get into the woods, and he's scrambling around. And they finally come to a stream. He thinks, thank God, it's over. So then he says, judge of my horror when I saw the president beginning to unbutton his clothes. And he said, this is an obstacle. We can't go around it. We have to go through it so we don't want to get wet. So I, too, for the honor of France, took off my clothes. <laughs> however, however, I left on my lavender kid gloves. It would be most embarrassing if we should meet ladies on the other side, <laughs> and I didn't have gloves on. <laughs> so, so then. FDR has a cocktail party every night in the White House when the war is going on. And the rule was you couldn't talk about the war. You could talk about gossip. He loved gossip. You could talk about books you read, movies you've seen, as long as you didn't talk about the war. And then after a while, the people he wanted to be at the cocktail hour, he wanted them to live in the White House to be ready for the cocktail hour. So um, he actually started inviting everybody to live on the second floor of the White House. His foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, came for dinner one night, slept over, never left until the war came to an end. His secretary, Missy Lahan, lived with the family in the White House. Lorena Hickok, who had a relationship with Eleanor in an emotional sense, lives next door to Eleanor. And the great Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in a bedroom diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So when I was reading about this, I just became obsessed with the thought of all these people in there bathrobes at night in the corridor that surrounds the second, the bedrooms on the second floor, and wishing when I'd been up there with President Johnson, I thought of asking, where was Churchill? Where was Eleanor? Where was Franklin? But I wasn't thinking in those terms then. So I mentioned this on a radio program, the Diane Rehm Show in Washington, when the book came out. And it happened Hillary Clinton was listening. So she called me up at the radio station, invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then, I could be on the second floor, my husband and I would be there, and we could figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. <laughs> So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 AM, the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband, and I went through every room up there with my map in hand. Yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was. The Clintons are sleeping where FDR was. And we were sleeping in Winston Churchill's bedroom. There was no way I could sleep. I was certain he was sitting in the corner drinking his brandy and smoking his cigar. In fact, that's, that's, that bedroom is my favorite story in World War II. It's a story of another naked man, I'm afraid. What happens is that Roosevelt comes in right after Pearl Harbor, Churchill's there, to tell him that he's come up with a new idea of calling themselves the United Nations against the Axis powers instead of the Associated Nations. But Churchill's just coming out of the bathtub and has nothing on. So Roosevelt said, I'm so sorry. I'll come back in a few moments. But Churchill, ever able to speak in a firm, formal voice, dripping from the tub, says, oh, no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. <laughs> So the next morning, I went in the bathtub, and I was truly in the presence of the greatness of the past. <laughs> you write uh, of LBJ as a visionary leader. And uh, among the things you write about him is everyone, uh, you, you talked about the, uh, the, the time at the Elms, um, right after the assassination, as he's sitting with his aides, laying out the, what, what essentially will be the great society. And you write, everyone agreed that Lyndon Johnson was a master mechanic of the legislative process. 
What became apparent from the first hours of his presidency, however, was that he meant to use these unparalleled skills in the service of a full-blown vision of the role the government should play in the lives of the people. What was LBJ's vision, and where did it come from? I think it came from long experience. I think that from the first days when he went as a principal and as a teacher and as a band leader, everything in the school to that little school in Catula, Mexican-American kids, poor, and he saw the pain of prejudice on their faces, he wanted them to do something to make their lives better. It was deep within him. And he could do it himself. He convinced they, there wasn't any athletic equipment. He used his first salary to do it. He got these kids into debating societies. And I think he carried with him that understanding when he goes into the National Youth Administration. Then that's one of the early times when he's able to use government resources to help young kids get jobs. And he loved it. I mean, there's this great moment when, and then when he brings rural electrification to the Hill Country, and he's now a young, young congressman, and FDR has the Rural Electrification Administration underneath this other administration, but he's been turned down by the REA guy because there's not enough people in the Hill Country. You have to have a certain number of people per mile to make it worthwhile, the government, to put this this whole electrification thing in. So he goes to see FDR to ask him, because they'd already met. And FDR knows how to delay somebody when you want to delay them. So he starts talking for some, oh my god, this is going to be my third naked story. For some reason, he starts talking about, did you know that naked Russian women look different than American women because they do so much outdoor work? All, before he knows it, his 15 minutes are up, and Johnson's out of there, and he wasn't able to convince him of anything. So the next time he goes back, he has a story to tell. And the story has to do with you know, people in the Hill Country and what it's like to not be able to, um, for the wife not to be able to have any kind of electric power to do her washing, as his, was true for his mother, what it's like for the guy to have to get up in the middle of the night with no milking machine. And so Roosevelt's beginning to listen. And then, he, so he calls up, Roosevelt calls up the REA guy and says, you know, I've got this young guy, Lyndon Johnson. He said, I know, I've turned him down already. And so Roosevelt says, well, you know, I think this is maybe something we should do. And he said, you can put it on my account. But then he says, and I've, I've heard something about those people in the Hill Country. They breed really fast. So soon they'll have enough people to make them all. <laughs> so, so Johnson walks out of there with this incredible, he said it was the happiest moment of his life. So all of these things happened. And then I think what happens to him, and I'm, I, I've really been thinking about this. I, I didn't think about this a lot before. But when he loses that race in 41, um, it's then that he begins to move in a, in a somewhat different direction. He, he becomes a wealthy man through the radio programs, and he becomes more conservative than he'd been otherwise. He couldn't have won a Senate seat again in 48 if he hadn't been so. And then when he gets into the Senate, he accumulates power and he becomes the most powerful majority leader in the history of the country. And then he has a heart attack in 1955. And, and he comes out of the depression from that heart attack. And he asks himself the question, you know, if I died now, what would I be remembered for? And I think that just brought back the person that he always was, that this is what I went into government for, this is what my father said you go into government for, to help people. And even then, he gets the first civil rights bill through the Senate. And so when, when he's ready to become president, all of this accumulated desire to use power to help people, I mean, when he, when he decides as, as president in those first days to give that speech to the joint session of Congress four days later, and he decides he's going to make civil rights his priority, passing the Kennedy bill will be his priority. And his, some of his aides are saying, you can't do this. Um, you're, you're going to facing your own election in 11 months. It's going to be filibustered. It'll be a failure. The Congress won't get anything else done. And you can't expend your coinage. A president has only a certain amount of coinage to expend. You shouldn't expend it on this. And then he makes this great statement, well, what the hell is the presidency for? I mean, and, that's, and then when he gives that voting rights speech, that same voting rights speech we were talking about at the very beginning, he, he wanted to talk about Catula. And he said that's what he wanted to bring up. And he had told Dick about the story of Catula many times. And this is actually one of the most powerful moments of that speech. And he says, when I was there in 1928 and I saw the pain of prejudice on these kids' faces, I never thought then that I would be standing here now with the power to do something to help their daughters and their sons and their children. And I'm going to, I have that power and I'm going to use it. And that's when the huge applause came. And that's that sense, I think it's that he had always wished that power could be used to make life better for people. He'd learned that from his father, he'd learned that from his upbringing, and now he had the chance to do it. 
you, you, uh, you mentioned Couture, that experience that LBJ had between his junior and senior years in college, where he went to Couture, Texas, he taught these Mexican-American school kids, and he saw through their eyes bigotry and injustice and hatred, racial hatred for the first time. And you write about the importance of empathy in leadership. So where does the empathy come from in your leaders? Are they born with it, or do they become more empathetic through experiences in their lives? Well, I think that's, that's what, when we think about public service or we think about broad political experience, that's the best of it. I mean, you're, you're meeting all sorts of people, and if you can feel and understand what they're feeling and you can understand their way of life, then empathy deepens. So I, as I say, I do think, I, I, if I had to take among the four, I would say that that Lincoln and LBJ, I believe, was born with it. I really do. Um, whereas Teddy and Franklin were not. Now, is that because they came from privileged backgrounds and they were more insulated in childhood, which they were? Is it because Lincoln and, and LBJ saw people you know, who were struggling much more than these other two did? Possibly that's true. Um, but, but both Franklin and Teddy developed it. I mean, I think, as I said, I think Franklin got it through the polio and through being willing to share his vulnerabilities with other people. He said, you learn humility when you have to try and move your big toe for two years, and when you finally do it, you have a celebration. That makes you understand the limitations of human beings, his own limitations. And he began to identify with people for whom fate had also dealt an unkind hand. I mean, he emerged much more warm-hearted than he'd been before. And Teddy, I think, through his experiences, began to develop it. But it is probably, if I had to choose a quality um, that you need in a leader, not just in a political leader, but it's the ability to just know what other people are thinking, to understand their points of view, so you can anticipate them, so you can argue with them, so you can have people around you who have different points of view, but you're not, you know, you're not shutting them off, you're understanding where they're coming from. It's what we need in this country so much right now. I mean, it's, the thing that, that is so worrisome underneath the political structure that is, you know, which is, we know what anxiety it's producing us, is that what we saw happen in this last election was that a large section of the country felt that they weren't being listened to and that the people in the rural areas felt cut off from the people in the cities. You feel these blue, blue things on either coast and then you have a whole bunch of people in the middle thinking different ways. And I think the, the only thing I've tried to think about it is that when I try to understand why was there more bipartisanship in the Congress than we've seen in the last couple decades, really, <laughs> in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and I think it's partly because a lot of the people who were in Congress had been in the Senate, had been in World War II, or mm -hmm. they'd been in the Korean War. So they brought with them that understanding of a common mission that cuts across party lines. And you're dealing with all sorts, not just party lines, race lines, section mm -hmm. lines. And, and then also in those days, they weren't racing home to raise money for their stupid campaigns. You know, it's the poison in the system, this funny finance that we have. They would stay in Washington, as Johnson did in those days. You'd play poker together, you'd drink together. You knew each other as human beings. That's what empathy is. You know each other as human beings, not as the other in a certain sense. And so I think, you know, I think what's happened, if, I, I don't think we necessarily have to have military service more, but I think the veterans bring something to, to public life that wasn't there before. I know that my own son graduated from Harvard College in June of 01, and then he um, joined the Army right after September 11th. He went to Iraq and Afghanistan. He earned a bronze star. He came out. He finally went to law school, which is what he was going to do at the beginning. But he said, nothing will ever equal what it was like to be with those kids in the platoon from all different parts of the country and know that you were welded together as a mission. Mm -hmm. So he's very much in favor now of, of national service program. This is something Teddy was for, Eleanor Roosevelt was for. I'm sure Lyndon Johnson would have loved something like this. In fact, a lot of his programs were pieces of it. But if you think about what a younger generation could do, if between high school and either college or vocational school, wherever they're going, that they could be together in different parts of the country, could learn about each other, doing something good, I'd love to see that happen. If I were younger, that's what I'd fight for. <clears throat> Well, you have brought presidents back to life, including these, these three. Only, you've only really known one of them, and that was Lyndon Johnson. How has your view of Lyndon Johnson changed since you knew him? You know, I think, I think it changed even just knowing him in those days. I mean, there's, there was a sense when I remember being in the anti-war marches, you know, and, and the, the terrible things that we would yell and scream you know, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? 
once I got to know him, as I, as I think was said with Larry in the introduction, it isn't that I changed my mind about whether this was the war to be fought at that time or whether it had to be fought or whether it was fought in the right way, but I certainly understood why he felt that way. And that's where the empathy that I felt toward him developed even when I knew him. But I must say, I, I've I can't even imagine the pride that, that that Johnson's family has been able to take in what happened with the 50 year anniversaries of all of the great legislation. You know, all of a sudden I think people began to realize, my God, the foundation of so much of our lives has been changed in a positive way by him. And I remember feeling proud of him. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. It was just sort of, I felt like, oh my God, if only he had been able to see this. I mean, he did, he did hope, and we talked about it in those last um, years when I was at the ranch, that if he were to be remembered for anything, it would be for civil rights. And there's no question that no president has done more since Abraham Lincoln for civil rights than Lyndon Baines Johnson. But there's everything else, too. <laughs> um, and, and the fact that the country is beginning to recognize it, the fact that he's coming up in the historian's polls. Uh, I'll never forget one time I was at the White House, and I don't think any of the presidents like these historian's polls. And I happened to be at the White House at a different time, not when I went there to see the second floor. It was right after President Clinton had won the election, so it's before Monica Lewinsky. But I was at the dinner table with him, and a historian's poll had come out that day. And he was like in the middle, and he was so mad. And he just, I, so I'm sitting next to him, he's saying, what do you, you know, like sort of, what do you historians know about these things? And I, no president is like them. John Kennedy didn't like them. And I understand that. And so I was trying to make him feel better. And that very day, the owner's son of the Los Angeles Dodgers had announced that they were going to sell the Dodgers. And there were headlines, maybe they're going to come back to Brooklyn. Of course, the Brooklyn Dodgers were my first love. And when they left, Walter O'Malley and those people, I thought I would hate them forever. And now suddenly, maybe they'd come back to Brooklyn. So I said to President Clinton, I said, look, I'll make you a corrupt bargain. If you bring them back to Brooklyn, um, I'll put you up a notch on the next historian's wall. <laughs> so, so anyway, he just said, I don't know if I have that power to do that. But one of the funniest things that has to do with today, oh, no, I won't talk about that. Let's go on. <laughs> Do you have another naked story you want to share no, with no, me? No, no, no. No, it's just that in the old <laughs> days, when you had the presidential historians' polls, James Buchanan was always at yeah. the bottom. Yeah. And um, so in the most recent poll, President Trump is at the bottom. So the Buchanan family was celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, we certainly live in turbulent times. And you quote Abraham Lincoln in the book. Uh, who said, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. We have a president in office who doesn't seem interested in nurturing public sentiment. Can he succeed? I mean, I think the big transition that has to be made for any president is the difference between campaigning and governing. Um, president Trump was able, as a campaigner, to master social media the same way that Lincoln had mastered the written word when he was president, when your speeches would be printed in full in the newspapers and they'd be read aloud all over the country. Teddy mastered that punchy phrase making when he was at the start of the national newspapers. FDR obviously had the, um, the radio and that voice for the radio. And then you had three television networks that were easier for presidents at the time of JFK and Ronald Reagan and LBJ to talk to the country as a whole. And then everything got divided with the social media. And he managed, because of his tweets, to, to reach people on his, that were on his side who felt they were on his side. But once you become president, that's why the important thing is you have to then govern as a unifying force. And um, Teddy Roosevelt used to take these train trips around the country to the states he lost as well as the states he won. You can't just go to the places where you already have won. You need to expand your base. And I think you can't govern unless you can begin to expand your base. And I think what, you know, what Lincoln would say is that Lincoln used to be able to debate as well as anybody. He was as quick on his feet as anybody could be. But he said once he became president, he hardly ever wanted to speak extemporaneously. And he would consider these tweets very extemporaneous. I mean, everybody's getting themselves into trouble by these instant emails and instant tweets. And somehow Lincoln had this wonderful ritual where he'd write a hot letter to the person 
and all of his anger would get out in the letter, and then he'd put the letter aside and never need to send it, because he would cool down psychologically. If only that advice could go to not only our president, but so many people that get themselves in trouble. Just think before you say something that's going to be hurtful or something that's going to divide the country. And I think it's that need that we all feel. And, but the interesting thing about the, the Lincoln sentiment, about with public sentiment, anything is possible, that's really telling us right now as citizens that I think you know, the way for us to deal with this anxiety is people have to get active in politics. Whatever side they're on right now, nobody can be a spectator anymore. It's absolutely essential that that, that and that activism seems to be growing. There's young people getting more interested in public life. Um, there's lots of women, record-breaking women running for office for the first time, more than ever before. But all of us as citizens, I think, have to just decide how we feel about the country right now. Where, where, we come, where we come from, why are we in this situation? It's deeper than just President Trump. We've had trouble for, for a long period of time now getting those people in Washington to get together. And it's trouble all over the country, people seeing each other in different ways. But as I say, I think that the lessons, what I think the most important lesson from the book is, and that's why it's titled Leadership in Turbulent Times, even though it meant these guys turbulent times, is so relevant today because I think if we can just remember that the history of this great country has taught us that we, when we have leaders and citizens, as Lincoln is saying, when public sentiment and the leader can be meshed together, civil rights movement and LBJ, great things can happen. And we can get through this, and I, I really know we're going to get through it again, as long as we believe in ourselves and we act instead of just sit obsessively looking at what's happening and we do something about it. That is a... Uh... That is a perfect note on which to end, although I'd love to continue the conversation. The book is Leadership in Turbulent Times. The author is the great Pulitzer Prize winning Doris Kearns Goodwin. Please join me in thanking her for being here. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>